Welcome to Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and once again I'm joined by Colin Watt to look at a moment in time, Colin, welcome back to the show. Thanks Paul for having us back. There are many moments in Celtic's history that we can look back on fondly, Colin, which one will we be reminiscing about today? So this one is particularly uh, emotional um, for a lot of fans. This is a moment from 2008 um, and the game in question, or the moment in question, is Venegur of Hesselink's header against Dundee United on the last day of the season when Celtic secured the title for Tommy. Um, a fantastic moment in Celtic's history. Brought not only three in a row for Celtic and for Gordon Strachan, but also it was memorial for Tommy, who sadly passed away a week before the game. So a very poignant moment in time that we're looking back at today. It was. It was one of those seasons, Colin, really. I mean, there were so many sad events that year and I think obviously the passing of Tommy hit a lot of people hard around about Celtic Park and the wider football community. Everybody's got a story about Tommy Burns and how special he was. That particular season also saw the loss of Phil O'Donnell and you know following the game up at Tanadice when we clinched the title there was the memorial game for Phil between Celtic and Motherwell legends and what we experienced was a, a sellout crowd uh, watching all the legends in memory of Phil O'Donnell. Some occasion that was as well. You know, when you see the full stadium coming out to pay tribute to an ex-player film against his former club. And we saw a lot of legends that day playing at Celtic Park. And I think when you look at the Dundee United game, there was a few people becoming legends in that team as well. What's your memories of that season as a whole, Colin? It was a bit of a, a topsy-turvy season. Obviously, we were starting to to really dominate the Scottish game again but the Rangers challenge seemed to kind of just be that they would grind out results they would get the results that you just thought they, would, they wouldn't get they would, they'd pick up a, a last minute penalty which is still a thing to this day I believe uh, that the ref plays on until Rangers get a penalty but they, they just keep pushing us and pushing us and we would drop silly points we, we would rotate the team too much and we would end up dropping points at home and especially when you look at the, the run of fixtures we had we won our last seven games to win the league but the game before that was at home to Motherwell and we lost 1-0. And at that point, I think it was known that Strachan was going to be leaving. But I think at that point, it felt as if the players had just said, that's us, we're not going to do this. It's Rangers title. And it kind of seemed as if it was kind of, let's start preparing for next season. But the turnaround in those last seven games was absolutely memorable. Um, the two victories at home against Rangers, some of the goals in those games and taking it right on and continuing that run right through to the last day of the season. A season which was extended, by the way. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. It was extended for a couple of days to allow Rangers to play in the UEFA Cup final in Manchester. But having that emotional setting behind it and lifting the title for Tommy, um, it just seemed like the perfect ending to an incredible season. So going back to the fact that the league season was actually extended, let's expand on that a wee bit, Colin, because obviously the revisionists out there would tell you tell you different. What was the circumstances behind that? So it all started back in December um, of that year. Both Celtic and Rangers were in the Champions League at that point. Celtic had done very well. They'd beaten the current Champions League holders, AC Milan, 2-1, and they'd qualified for the last 16 with a victory over Shakhtar Donetsk. But Rangers required a victory over French side Lyon to qualify for their last 16. The request was made into the SFA by Rangers saying that Lyon had been granted a game off of their schedule so that they could prepare for the tie. And what actually transpired was that that wasn't true. The SFA had already, or the SPFL had already granted Rangers a game off and then Lyon put their request in. So that was a game that was extended, that was moved to a later date. And then as Rangers continued on their run to the AFA Cup final, it was discussed that the season should be extended, something which did not happen when Celtic made their way to Seville. But it was discussed and eventually it was extended by a couple of days to allow Rangers a couple of days break in between games. And it pushed the last day of the season from the Saturday out to the Thursday. Mm -hmm. So this is a Thursday night game, quite unusual under the circumstances. Rangers continue to insist that it was against them. They did not get the extension that they required. But if we take it back, when Celtic actually went to Seville, there was a quote by Alex McLeish, who was the Rangers manager at the time, who said, I don't know what Celtic are complaining about, 
They should just get on with it. I wish we were in their position. So what goes around comes around, but Rangers did get the break in the extra time that Celtic didn't get when they went to Seville. But yet, here we are, 12 years on, and it's still all about sporting integrity. It's all about rewriting history as well, Colin, by some people. You spoke about the kind of form that Celtic finished the season in, and you went further back talking about the defeat to Motherwell, but that was one of a number of games that we went on a, a really poor run of form, which probably extended back to the Champions League game against Barcelona in the new Camp when they beat us 1-0. We then went on a, a really poor run of form. There was a draw to Aberdeen in the Cup. They then knocked us out in the replay. We drew against Dundee United and we were beaten against Rangers and Motherwell back to back. So it was looking pretty grim and what it required was Celtic to really grind out the last results, one of which was against Rangers, of course, in the 3-2 game. And the third goal scored that day, the winning goal scored that day by none other than Barry Robson, who, when you look at the season that Celtic had and you look at the the figures within that team, Colin, who were pivotal in Celtic's turnaround, you look at Barry Robson, don't you, and Paul Hartley, I think these are the two guys that really put in a shift in the second half of the season. What's your memories of their performances? Um, Certainly the game that you touched on there was the Barcelona game and the Barcelona first leg at Celtic Park not only was that probably the best atmosphere I'd experienced to that point um, but it was one of the best games of football as well we scored two fantastic goals that night goals from Robson and from Venegur of Hesselink with the headers and we really gave Barcelona a game and we're talking about a team that had Thierry Henry, Ronaldinho and Lionel Messi so we, we really gave that team a good go, and we took the lead at half time. If we had a second half collapse, which isn't a surprise for Celtic, but we actually were leading that tie twice. So it just shows you the kind of team that we had there. And as you see, the impact of Robson, he was pivotal, especially in those games against Rangers, the two games that sort of turned the tide of the season. A guy you mentioned as well, Paul Hartley. I remember. One of the games, I think it was the 2-1 game, when Benegur of Hesselink scored in the last minute. The first couple of seconds of the game, the whistle goes and Paul Hartley flies into a tackle, which is an absolute stonewall yellow card. But you get away with it in a Celtic Rangers game because you're setting the scene, you're letting the players know that you're there, and the referee kind of lets you away with it. And when Hartley did that, that set the tone for the whole night. Celtic started to come into the game to start to dominate the game. OK, eh, Novo pulled the goal back after Nakamura's wonder goal, but there was a drive from the fans and it really led us on. And a 93rd minute winner against Rangers is just something that you'll never forget. And Big Venegur heading it in. Um, it was absolutely outstanding. Being a Wednesday night game under the lights, it was fantastic. I, I really, really enjoyed that game. Great memories looking back and tinged with that kind of sadness, you know, thinking about Tommy Burns, the players coming back on the park with the the Tommy Burns t-shirts on. So many of the guys had been influenced positively by Tommy. I think about Tommy Burns, Colin, as the man whose testimonial it was when I went to my first Celtic game. It was a Tommy Burns testimonial back in 1987, long before your time, Colin. And thereafter, that started my love affair with Celtic. You know, it started long before then. I just wasn't allowed to go to the games because my old man didn't want me tagging along, obviously, at that time. But Tommy Burns then was the manager when I got my first season ticket. So he is an omnipresent figure in my Celtic supporting life right up until he sadly passed away. What's your favourite story or memory that someone shared with you about Tommy Burns? Others, we could have a, a full podcast on the stories I've heard of Tommy Burns. The man was just an absolute gentleman. Took the reins at Celtic in one of our most difficult periods and arguably probably should have been there to stop the 10, but unfortunately it wasn't. Uh, There's a story that actually comes out from this season, which is something that's probably worth reflecting upon, and it's the fact that even on his deathbed, Tommy sent Scott Brown's sister, who was battling cancer, a bunch of flowers, and he sent that and she received it a couple of hours after Tommy had passed away. And to think that even in the moments when he knew he was coming towards the end, he was still thinking of other people, it just sums up Tommy Burns for me. I remember Gordon Strachan sharing that story with myself. And you look at that Celtic team, you know, Scott Brown was going through his own personal issues with his sister, you know, fighting cancer. And as you say, for Burns to be so selfless, even in his last moments, 
to ensure that those flowers were sent. You know, it just shows you the mark of the man. This was a season that will always be remembered for, for Tommy Burns, and Tommy is one of the figures that will always be remembered at Celtic Park. Let's talk about the goal then. Describe the goal to us. The goal comes from a corner. We're sitting, it's getting edgy. There's about 20 minutes to go. Rangers are currently 1-0 down at Pataudry. So the title, as it stands, is in Celtic's favour by one point. The corner comes over from Paul Hartley and Venegar must jump at least eight or nine feet in the air to head the ball down past soon-to-be Celtic goalkeeper Lucas Saluska into the back of the net. The fact that there were so many Celtic fans there, I think Dundee United had given Celtic additional tickets for this game as well. Um, the scenes behind the goal and all around the stadium is just incredible. Venegur goes off to celebrate with his hands in the air, praying for Tommy, um, and you see the Celtics backroom staff, including Gordon Strachan, running onto the pitch in delight. I remember watching it with my dad. The game was on Satanta. If people don't know what Satanta is, um, then you're probably showing your own age here. But Satanta was showing the game, and me and my dad just hugging and celebrating the fact that uh, we'd actually done it, and it looked as if the title and the helicopter was coming to land it. Tanadice to give us the trophy and it was it was an incredible emotional moment in time um, and it's one that I'm delighted that we're looking back on today If you remember Satanta Colin then you'll remember Satanta's little helper If you remember Satanta and Satanta's little helper you'll remember Celtic TV actually being a channel that you could flip over to as well I know back in the day there's also the debate I would guess and I think Gordon Strachan has probably alluded to this after the emotional turmoil of losing such a close friend as Tommy Burns because Gordon Strachan and Tommy became very, very close during the time at Celtic. He looks back on that perhaps with a tinge of regret that he didn't bow out after the the league win. He kept going for another season and the fourth season was pretty much an anti-climax, wasn't it? We've spoken about it on the podcast before, Kevin Graham and I, about how that Rangers side that won the league in Gordon Strachan's last season was was a poor side, and obviously Celtic must have been poorer because we came second. Is it as simple as saying that? Because I know that Bonehead from Oasis said that the band should have split up after Nebworth in 1996 at their peak, but it's easy to say that with hindsight. Should Strachan have gone after this, or was he right to stay on? Oh, do you know, it was interesting because the theory was that Strachan was going to leave. That was it. There wasn't the thought that he was going to carry on. And I think if it wasn't for the fact that we'd managed to turn that season around and won the title for Tommy, then I don't know if Strachan would have took us into the following season. But I feel as if when you've won the season, there is that part of you that says, well, we have to go and defend the title. And Strachan did that. But I think even he would look back on it in hindsight and feel that he'd, he'd taken Celtic to a certain point and he just wasn't going to take it any further. When you look at the following season, some of the signings that he, he brought in, not many of them actually improved the, the first team. Samaras's loan deal became permanent. We're seeing guys like Glenn Leuvens, Sean Maloney returned. It wasn't as if the backing was there for him to make that next step. He'd made the last 16 of the Champions League. He'd taken Celtic to three titles in a row. And if it was if at this period of time, that was as far as he could probably take Celtic. It needed someone else to come in and actually change it round. On the flip side, I guess he's maybe looking at that as well. And, you know, having got Celtic into the last 16 of the Champions League twice, he's maybe looking at progressing. But as you say, that comes along with the ability to improve your team. Now, you look at Sean Maloney and you would maybe think, well, Sean Maloney could improve that side. The other player, obviously that he was interested in, in buying was Stephen Fletcher and we lost out on Stephen Fletcher in the January. Kevin Graham and I spoke about the second half of that season and the real need for goals. We really lacked a goal score in the second half of that season and you were probably arguing the toss over a couple of hundred grand between Peter Lowell and Rod Petrie at that time. Something that reared its ugly head much later. So you do have a level of sympathy for Strachan. It could well have been, but it's all should have been, could have been looking back. Just unfortunate we didn't go ahead and buy the big man Fletcher at that time. I think he would have done well with Celtic at, at this particular time. Jan Venegura Hesslink was still in amongst the goals. Must be the longest name ever in the history of Celtic Football Club. What's your memories of the big man when he played? Were you a fan? Oh, I, was, um, I was a big fan of Venegura. In fact, just recently um, I've managed to secure a top from this season which has Venegur of Hesselink's name on the back of it. And it's a classic jersey. It's a 
I'm sure we've spoken about this with Paul Lamb. Um, it's the 40th anniversary of the Lisbon Lions jersey. And I remember at the time, you used to have to pay £1.50 a letter and a pound a number or something like that. And people were complaining that it was going to cost about £20-odd pound to get very good of wrestling on the back of the top. But Celtic ended up putting out a, a template which was basically put on and it was £10 or something. And I think every time there seemed to be a, a holiday coming round, it was a special offer, get Vinny Gura of Hesseling on the back of your jersey for X amount, as if it was an encouragement to, to get these names on the jerseys. But I remember I actually missed his first game uh, against Hibs, where he came on and uh, he played and scored twice. Um, I wasn't well that day and I didn't make the game. And I remember that he'd scored the goals and he just seemed to be the great partner for Scott McDonald. The two of them linked up really, really well. The little and large combination, which is seen through the history of football, really, if you look at um, striking partnerships, it works really, really well. And the two of them complemented each other very well. And it's for reasons like that why we ended up moving on guys like Kenny Miller, because it, it just didn't fit into that style of football. So McDonald and Venegura Hesslink was just a, a fantastic partnership. It was, I think, in the fourth season. I mean, Celtic as a whole, you know, the form dipped, but Venegura Hesslink was a shadow, really obvious for myself in that final season at Celtic. But when you look at the player that we signed, Colin, we signed a Dutch internationalist from PS Eindhoven in 2006 for £3.5 million. I mean, that, as a buy, was the type of player that we are looking at now, thinking that that would excite me now. That would excite me now, that type of player. And I know that there's always a need to bring in younger dare I say, project signings who may develop into a Wan Yama, who may develop into a Frimpong. That's that's fine. I totally get that. But it would be good when Celtic are going for 10 in a row to buy that quality of player in that Jan Venegur of Hesslink certainly was at that time. I know that his form dipped. He eventually got a move down south. You know, he's only 41 years of age now, Colin. Yeah, he's still very young. And he retired quite young as well. He retired at the end of 2011-12 season. So they're talking nine years ago. So he was only really 32 at the time when he retired, which yeah. for a footballer is, is very, very young. It is. And I mean, when you said you acquired something, I thought you were going to tell me that you'd acquired an interview with him. So there's one for your to-do list, Colin. Go out and get the big fella. I think most people do look fondly back on Jan Venegura Hesselink, and it's it's quite ironic that at the time that he scored that goal that brought us the, the league championship, the number one song in the UK charts, any idea what it might have been? No, 2008. No, no, no idea. It was a Manchester band called the Ting Tings and the song was That's Not My Name. Fantastic song. A classic song. It was a massive hit back in the day and it was sitting at number one when Celtic won the league at Tannadice. But I think the best, the best thing to look at here and to focus on just finally to wrap it up is the celebrations after the game. Tommy Burns obviously being on a lot of the fans' minds. Um, actually, some of the Celtic supporting Dundee United players that were there that day, including Noel Hunt, guys like that, who stayed on the park after the game, much to the annoyance of their own supporters and from the supporters across Glasgow, um, who stayed on to, to celebrate with Celtic. Um, but I have to say, it's, a, it's the one thing I remember from after the game was the fact that Dundee United actually played over the tannoy system, Mac the Knife, and you see Gordon Strachan with a tear in his eye walking round the Tannadice pitch singing Mac the Knife, which is Tommy Burns' karaoke song, um, and it's something that Tommy Burns is really remembered for. I actually feel a bit quite emotional thinking about going back to that because it was a, a really um, emotional time. To, to just watch that, even being on TV. I can't imagine having been involved in that game, what it must have been like uh, for the players, for the staff, and even for the fans there that day. Well, Colin, all that's left for me to say is thank you once again for joining me on A Celtic State of Mind. Thanks, Paul. Take care. 